To say that God is sovereign basically means that he is God, it means he is all powerful. He's in control over all things. He rules and reigns over all of creation, including even the little details of our lives. He's not frustrated or upset by what he sees on earth. You know, for us, especially kids, if they drop something, we say, uh oh, you know, God isn't looking in heaven going, uh oh, you know, what happened there? That messed up over there. What happened over there? He's not, that, that's not God. God cannot say, uh oh, right? And um, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse, uh, well, you've got it up there. I'm not going to say every verse, you guys, because there's so many of them, but they're there. <laughs> Okay, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. This is the plan determined for the whole world. For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? And Colossians says, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Proverbs chapter 19, 21 says that God's plan will prevail. And in Ephesians, it says that God works everything out according to his will. But we don't understand God, right? <laughs> or his ways or his plans. And if we did understand, we would be God, right? We would understand everything. And so as human beings, we don't understand. And as Isaiah says, and you know this one probably really well, my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says. My ways are not your ways. And so we struggle to understand how disability could be part of God's plan. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, we struggle with that. Okay, and in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, I really love this scripture. It says that from him and through him, and to him are all things. From him, through him, and to him are all things. So we're going to look at specifically seven areas that God is sovereign over. Though he's sovereign over everything, let's talk about some, some specific areas. The first one is nature. We know that God is sovereign over nature. We see that in creation. God created. We also see this in the book of Genesis with the, with the worldwide flood, Sodom and Gomorrah those show that God is sovereign over nature. Also Exodus, all the plagues, um, darkness. I, I, this I think is my favorite one where God could actually make a line and say on this side in broad daylight at midday, I don't know if it's exactly midday, broad daylight, the Israelites were in sunshine. The Egyptians were in, do you remember? Total darkness, right? Total darkness. Can you imagine? I love that one. So he can just draw a line, some are in darkness, some are in daylight. Um, parting of the Red Sea, so that's also an exodus. Then we have, in going to the New Testament, um, a story we're all familiar with in the book of Mark, when Jesus is in a boat, sleeping in a storm. You can imagine. Have any of you been in a boat in a storm? No? You have. A few of you have. It's pretty bad. You pray more, right? <laughs> Okay, I have been. And so imagine you're being tossed, but he's sleeping. He's totally peaceful, of course. And the disciples go over and, Jesus, Jesus, wake up. We're going to die. They're freaking out. And Jesus just kind of, you know, wakes up and says, be still. And immediately the wind and the waves died down. And then it says that they were even more terrified <laughs> because they said, who is this? Because they didn't understand that he was God at that point. Of course, the wind and the waves obey God. Amen? Okay, number two, God is sovereign over world rulers. Uh, when we're preaching this in Uganda, I always say, you know, uh, we don't know how long Museveni will be in. He's been there for over 30 years. But here, we have no idea how long Trudeau will be in. <laughs> you know, God alone knows. Some of us think he should have gone a long time ago. God knows, right? And in Daniel, we see this so much where God says the different kingdoms that are going to be coming. Um, he, it's got it, he's got it all planned out. So he changes times and seasons. He removes kings. He sets up kings. He rules the kingdom of Ben, and he gives it to whom he will. Okay, number three, God is sovereign over the good and the bad. In Lamentations, it says, Who has spoken, and it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded it? 
Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and bad things come? And Isaiah says, I form the light. This is God speaking. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do these things. All right, and God is sovereign over life and death. And I don't know if any of you guys keep diaries, but God has an appointment book and there's an appointment for each of us to die. He knows the day we were born and he knows the day we will go home. And nothing is going to change his appointment. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, it says, The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. And then in the book of Acts, uh, Paul is speaking and he says, he says, he, Jesus, he's talking about Jesus, was handed over to you, he's speaking to the Israelites, by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Okay, so I have a question for you. Who killed Jesus? Come on, anybody? Who killed Jesus? God? So was saying God. Any, any others? There's a few answers, by the way. God. Mm -hmm. Who else? Come on. Pardon? Mankind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mankind. <laughs> or people kind. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is specifically talking about the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Our own sins, right? Uh, who nailed him on the cross? The Roman soldiers who washed his hands of him, right? So we see that in God's plan, it's God's deliberate plan, but he used many other people and many other circumstances to make it happen, right? But God was not going, oh my goodness, they've killed my son. What do I do now? What's plan B, right? Obviously, guys. I mean, I know that you know this, right? This was the reason he came. Jesus came to die, okay? But still, there were wicked people at work to accomplish God's purposes. Do we see that? Okay. So God is sovereign. Next point, God is sovereign over suffering and disability. So again, talking about Jesus, Jesus is another uh, name that's, or title, uh, name, I guess. It, it, we talk about him being the suffering servant. And he lays out the plan for his life, which includes suffering in Luke chapter 9. Um, and he said, Jesus is speaking, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day and raised, be raised to life. Also, this is prophesied on Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces, faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And when we read this about Jesus, I think we can also see similarities to with how people with disabilities can often be looked at or how they can feel. They can feel rejected. They can be familiar with pain. People can hide their faces from them. And um, so Jesus is very familiar with what we are going through as families affected by disability. He suffered and uh, there was a purpose in his suffering. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, See now that I, even I am he, there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. And I love how he emphasizes it three times. I, even I, I am he. You can't mistake it for anyone else. Psalm 139 is a very precious chapter. Verse 16 says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He knew who would be here today. Then we can look at the life of Joseph. Joseph was a man who suffered a lot. He was hated by his brothers. He was beaten. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused his whole life. I mean, he did prosper at some point, but his whole life was full of suffering, right? Yeah. So Genesis chapter 45, I love what he says when the brothers finally come to him. He says, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then 
It was not you who sent me here, but God. Really? Isn't that amazing? Because who sent him there? God and the brothers, right? And the slave traders. And who falsely accused him? Potiphar's wife. I mean, we see, we see wickedness being done on the earth, but we see God in control. Amen? And I love his perspective. And if only we had that perspective, it would be amazing. But it's hard to have that perspective. But Joseph had this beautiful perspective. And he wasn't able, he didn't revenge on his brothers. He was able to, um, to have a relationship with them because he realized that it's actually God. And isn't this amazing that the reason Joseph went into Egypt was so that the Israelites would come to Egypt? The, is, every time I, I always get goosebumps when I say this, the reason that the Israelites were there were to be formed into a nation, right? Then they left and they went into their promised land eventually after a few years wandering around, right? They went and inherited their promise. So isn't that amazing how God had used, he used one man to go and suffer so that a nation could be formed. Can you imagine that what could happen to us today could have consequences for like 400 years from now? I, it's mind blowing. So anyway, God is sovereign. He is amazing. Okay. Number six, God is sovereign over demonic power. In Uganda, we see this a lot more where people believe that people with disabilities are actually cursed. I don't think in North America, people really believe that, but uh, interestingly, uh, a week or two ago when we were in Saskatchewan, I was talking to a lady who recently hurt her hip. So she's walking with a cane and it surprised me that she has been asked by a few people, not even just one, that do you have any um, unconfessed sin in your life? Um, do you think that basically they're attributing it also, they were asking, I don't remember their exact words that they used, but they're asking her, um, they think that it was caused by Satan as well. So I think a lot of people can assume that bad things and people see disability as bad, um, come from the devil. So how do we handle that? Well, one of the analogies I like to use is like a goat. Okay. So a goat is tied on a rope and it, it ha it can only go as far as the rope allows it to go. Okay. So if a goat is to eat a garden, that goat has eaten the garden for sure, but it was tied on a rope and allowed in that area to eat the garden. Can't do anything, can't go outside of those bounds. And I think that one um, of the stories that we'll look at is Job um, shows us this in a good picture in a, in a personal way. Sometimes God, let's, okay, let's look at Job. Is that up there? Yeah. So Job, I think we all know this, the story of Job. There's a start, so that very interesting conversation in heaven between God and Satan. And God is very proud of Job. And he says, look at my servant, Job. He's a great guy. He loves me. He's doing all the right things. And Satan says, hmm, you think he doesn't love you for anything? You've given him everything. So God and Satan almost make like a, a little bit of a bet in a way. God says, okay, well, let's see. And so God says, okay, you can go and you can take everything away from him. And that's what Satan go, does. But, and I'm going to use Pastor Brent here. God puts a boundary around him. He puts a perimeter hedge and he says, but you cannot touch the man's life. Okay. So God told him what he could do and what he couldn't do. Right. And then that's what he went out and did. And, um, he lost everything. And of course his response was amazing. He says, well, God gives and God takes away. Well, this looks confusing because who took the stuff away from him? Didn't it look like it was Satan? He's the one that went and took stuff away, right? But it was God. Job credited God. And what I would love to say to us today is we need to give God the glory rather than looking at Satan. Sometimes we look at the practical of, yeah, it was Satan that took the stuff. But where does our glory go? Who are we glorifying? Do we want to glorify that, yeah, Satan has this control? Or are we glorifying God who allowed him and gave him um, the parameters? And Job also says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And so Satan wreaked havoc under the sovereign control of God. And God has an overall purpose in the world that he is accomplishing. And sometimes, yes, he will use Satan or other wickedness to accomplish it. 
there's some other scriptures there. Uh, King Saul, I'm not going to read that one right now. Paul, um, 2 Corinthians 12, you're familiar with this, I know as well. Um, Paul was given him a thorn in the flesh. He says, a messenger of Satan to torment him. Three times he pleaded with the Lord, please take it away from me. But God said, no, I'm not going to. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And this is a beautiful scripture because, again, we see the two at work. We see wickedness at work, but we see God in control. And we see a response in it. What do we do? We pray and cry out to him. And we see a submission of our will to accept his will for us and to rely on his power. His power is definitely made uh, perfect in our weakness. Now, I want us also just to be clear um, with the next slide. Of course, God is holy, righteous, and good. There's no wickedness in him at all. There's a few scriptures there. God is light. He is good. He is holy. He's a rock. His ways are perfect. So God is holy. He will just use whichever means he needs to to accomplish his purposes. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's look at the benefits of suffering. Okay. Sometimes we wonder, could there possibly be a benefit of suffering? I don't want to suffer, but yes, there are benefits, and I know that we've experienced them as well. I'm sure you can testify to these. So um, certainly there's a benefit. God glorifies himself in that. He can glorify himself in our suffering, and he can glorify um, himself in displaying his grace through us. Sometimes he like as in the story of the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, sometimes he's glorified through healing. And that is amazing. That also seems to be a little bit more rare than when he glorifies himself through the persevering. Is that right? Is that in your observations? Yeah. So we pray for healing, yes, and that's a whole other topic we're not getting into today. But he is glorified in that persevering, in that endurance, in the long suffering, just like we talked about with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. Another benefit is to make us more like Christ because we go through that refiner's fire. So we become, we become more Christ-like. And a scripture uh, in James here, it says, consider it pure joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never really been able to do this scripture too much. Consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And Romans chapter 5 says, we also rejoice on our, in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Hebrews chapter 12 says, endure hardship as discipline. God is actually treating you as sons. He disciplines us for our good that we can share in his holiness. Doesn't seem pleasant at the time, of course, but later on, it does produce that harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Okay, another benefit of suffering is to lead others to Christ. Interestingly, um, when Paul was in uh, Galatia, he got sick and had to stay, and then he preached, and people got saved, and the church was formed. And so he tells them in, in Galatians 4.13, it was because of an illness that I first preached to you. He had other plans, but a sickness caused that church to grow. And Acts chapter 8 says, uh, this is with the early church, a great persecution broke out and all were scattered and wherever they went, they preached the gospel. So they were having a wonderful time as the early church. Maybe you've been in those worship services that you just never want to end and in, or enjoy a fellowship, a home fellowship, and you just it's so good you never want it to end. But God is like, there's other people out there that need to know so persecution is what sent them. And we hate persecution, but it does. And statistically, you can look at where there's been persecution, the gospel does get spread. God has his ways of, of doing his things that we don't always understand. Okay, number four. Another benefit is to develop our relationship with God. God really wants his people to turn to him. Throughout the book of Amos, you will see this phrase over and over again, yet you have not returned to me. He mentions sending famine, plagues, different things. And he keeps saying, yet you have not returned to me, yet you have not returned to me. He wants his children to come to him, to cry out to him. And that usually happens in suffering. When we're fine, we can forget about God. 
But when we suffer, people tend to remember and want to turn or look for help. Just like Jesus, um, we can learn to pray and have a, have a relationship. It, it can force us or, or want us to turn and have a, have a conversation with our Father. And when Jesus, just before he was crucified, he said he was praying. He said, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup from me. And then he submitted his will and said, but not my will, let your will be done. And so in suffering, we can depend on God. We can develop our relationship with him. In our suffering, it helps us to align our wills with God's. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 8 to 10, um, Paul is talking about all the things that they went through. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed about all the troubles we experienced in Asia. Great pressure far beyond our ability to endure. We even despaired of life itself. And we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope and that he will continue to deliver us. Okay, and number five, the fifth perspective, or um, sorry, not perspective, benefit of suffering, is it gives us an eternal perspective. People are tired of living here. <laughs> Life sucks. We want to get to heaven. <laughs> it's better there. And so that's the summary of this, Second Corinthians 4. Outwardly, we're wasting away. Yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles, though they don't always feel so light are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what we see, but on what is unseen. For what we see is temporary, but what we don't see, that is eternal. And 2 Corinthians 5 says, how weary we grow in our present bodies. That is why we look forward eagerly to the day when we shall have heavenly bodies that we will put on like new clothes, now we look forward with confidence to our heavenly bodies, realizing that every moment we spend in these earthly bodies is time spent away from our eternal home in heaven with Jesus. So once we've understood that God is sovereign and what the benefits are as well, and that God is working through all of creation and all of time to accomplish his good purposes, what is the response that we would have? And I would suggest one that it's to worship him because when I realize how amazing and how sovereign and good he is, it really just causes my heart to worship. And so we worship him. That is the first thing that we would do. The second is that we would love others who are suffering and we would want to share this truth with others to help them realize, to get the perspective because we are so blessed to have this perspective without the word of God to guide us without God's words that sink into our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be so lost. And we know that there are so many out there that are lost looking for this truth. So it would, it would basically ignite that fire to share this with other families and other people. The fact that God can take something so painful and confusing and use it for his good would cause us to worship. So we worship him who takes the shameful things of this world to confound the wise. We worship him who takes the lowly and despised and gives them a place of honor. We worship him who gives us beauty for ashes. We exalt him whose plan stands firm forever. God is sovereign. To him be the glory forever. Amen.